Here I am in the Shetland Isles, in the far north of Scotland. Farmers in the British Isles who have been rearing animals for thousands of years are behind numerous so-called intensive domestic breeds, which respond to society's need for mass consumerism. But this farming community has also preserved much older, more primitive, hardier breeds, which have survived throughout the ages by adapting to their environment. However, before I reach this sanctuary, my journey begins 700 kilometers further south in the city of Edinburgh. There's no mistaking the fact that we're in Great Britain. This is Bobby. He stayed by his master's grave for 15 years. He is well loved by Scots, who touch his nose for luck. The red deer is one of the emblems of the city of Edinburgh. He is painting Highland cattle. These are actually hats. There are some people with a dog up there. These dogs make great pets. Yeah, I see. So they're Highland cats. Ah, then I have to go to the islands. Yes. This is lovely. As you can see, there are parks all over Edinburgh. It's a very green city, which is great. But Edinburgh is just my point of departure. In a few days, I'll be heading up north to meet some domestic breeds that are not found anywhere else in the world and have remained virtually unchanged for centuries. Don't forget, all these domestic breeds owe their existence to humans. They came from wild animals who were artificially selected by breeders and domesticated thousands of years ago, unlike wild species which came from a process of natural selection and adapted to their environment. To explore the link between domestication and evolution, I would have liked to talk to Charles Darwin, but unfortunately he's not available for a chat, so I'm off to Edinburgh University to see if anyone can shed any light on the matter. I'm looking for the University of Edinburgh. Hello, oh, yeah. Professor Charles Worth. Nice to, to meet you. you. I'm Remy. <laughs> Whoa, you're working here? Yes, yeah, well, this is the summer. The uh, people here are looking after the microscopes before the students come back in the You office. have many microscopes. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Brian Charlesworth has spent his life studying species and their environment. Domestication is the transformation of a wild species into a domesticated one. Carried out by humans over several generations, it holds no secrets for him. Here we go. Whoa! <laughs> ah, the gallery. The gallery, yes. It's great. It's got a guardian snake. Um... Ah, big head. <laughs> I would like to know uh, if you could explain me um, what is the difference between natural selection that Darwin studied well yeah. and artificial selection that we can observe in domestication? Well, um, in the case of artificial selection, it's the man who, or woman who's choosing the next generation. So in the case of natural selection, it's the environment, uh, which is, so to speak, making the choice. Of the domestic breed, they, they, answer to, uh, they bring an answer to a need yeah. of man. The, the sort of sheep which would say do well you know in, in nice flat fields in the south of england would certainly have a hard time mm. uh living in, in on the hills in, in scotland or north of england adaptation is a relative concept isn't that's mm. basically what, what the reason why there are these different breeds of animals in different places they, they are or the same goes for, for varieties of plants as well mm -hmm. things do well in one place they won't do well in another place 
This is funny because we have a good example here. This is a stuffed mountain sheep. It's thought to be the ancestor of all the domestic sheep in the world. And below it, we have the skull of a ram, which is a domesticated animal with one characteristic which has been reinforced, the spiral on its horns. You can see how we modified the anatomy of the animals. Today, humans have mastered the genetic manipulation of animals. They can identify the best genes and perform artificial insemination. Time to head to the Royal Highlands Show, where the best breeders and champions of the latest breeds come together every year. It's a mass gathering. Here, the breeds on show have resulted from artificial selection taken to the extreme. They are known as super breeds. British blonde. Voilà, beautiful. Double muscle. An extra muscle has literally been added to their haunches. It's crazy. This is a bodybuilder sheep. It's huge. It's the result of over-domestication. They barely look like sheep anymore. They look like dragons or something. These orange cheviot sheep have been dyed. It's hilarious. There are yellow ones, golden yellow ones over there. There's a big grey ram over there too. These sheep would never survive in nature if they were returned to the wild. At least not for long. This is where the greatest concentration of super breeds is to be found. This is a giant sheep. With a head that big, it's almost a cow. These sheep weigh up to 160 kilograms. There's no way that man can keep hold of two of them, and there's no way they could leap onto rocks, not without breaking the rock. It's funny how humans wanted to create an animal to suit their tastes. It's no longer a case of responding to their needs. It's a matter of taste. To get one up on your neighbors, you create your own breed. That's why there is such a diversity of breeds, hundreds of domesticated breeds, some of them coming from a single wild breed. This is a Jacob sheep, and Jacob sheep have four horns. Natural selection would have wiped out these four-horned sheep. This is modern breeding. Mutant characteristics are selected to form new breeds. This is playing with these animals. Humans have manipulated them. The other real star of the show are the famous Aberdeen Angus cattle. They are bred for their meat and are the epitome of the superbred animal. Their wild ancestors have been hugely modified over thousands of years. I'm looking for a young cattle breeder I've been told about who has entered her cow or cows into the competition. They're beautiful, they're glistening. There she is. Stephanie? Hello. Hello. I'm Remy, nice Hi, to meet nice you. To meet How you. are you? Good, thank you. This is Avora. How old is she? 18 months. Okay. Is she in a good shape, like, for the... Yeah, she's in cow. Show, yeah. She's, ah. in, she's got a baby inside her. And she has the baby inside? Uh-huh. So, when I, it's time, I'll get her up and I'll brush her off and get all the straw off her, okay. and then I'll get her um, all glued up so she looks like one's over there and all pretty and pampered. Great. Okay, now you start with the gel. It's a new gel. This gel contains black dye, so as well as making the hair stand up, it also fixes the colour. It's weird, it completely changes the texture. Because she knows it's you. Yeah, she likes it, she's licking her lips. I want to join in. I want to do Evora's hair. Can I have a shot? Yeah, of course. Just sometimes she kicks. Okay. Okay, she has a beautiful coat, very short. I reckon she's in with a chance today. She just kissed me. She must like you. Why? She doesn't kiss many people. Yeah. <laughs> right, it's time to go. These shows are like top level sports competitions. Breeding families' reputations are at stake and nothing is left to chance. The animals are pampered and prepared like racing cars before a race. Behind the scenes, the mood is akin to that in the paddock. Here, a few minutes before entering the ring, the concentration of those preparing their cows is palpable. In a few minutes, Stephanie and Devora will enter the ring. A man in the crowd is observing all this preening with a watchful eye. His name is William. He is one of the judges. Do you think uh, Evora has a chance? Yes, she's a very good heifer. Straight, go.
to look at the judge. Look at he's, Stephanie's oh, yeah, heifer there. Mobile, yeah. So he's now really looking at them individually here. And he's going to look at breed traits, breed character, what they're head. I mean, Labrine Angus is an old traditional breed, so, so you're wanting for breed character, nice open face, broad muzzle, nice ears. You want their ears to look at the judge. Yeah. Look at the heifer as she goes forward. That's heifer saying to the judge, look at me, look at me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm special. Good ones do that. The Aberdeen Angus beef is the second most recognised brand name after in the world, Hefford? after Coca-Cola. Oh, so, gosh, so that's so incredible. Go for it, Stephanie. He's he looks at Stephanie. He looks at Stephanie. Yeah. This is Stephanie. She's been drawn in first, I think, yes? For me, it would be what I would have done as well. OK, so. as a judge, yes. I believe you. Yes. <laughs> allez, allez. Yes, she's got Yay! it. Yay! You're yeah. right, huh? Yes, no, no. We won. Yes. <laughs> so advanced breeds that yes. someone who huh. wouldn't know mm -hmm. uh, the high level breeding would be yes. surprised, no? Almost. What we can do with genetics now, we can pick the Miss World from mm. Scotland mm. and mate her to the Mr. Mr. Universe from America. Mm. This is part of do. modern domestication. This is technology moved on with semen and embryos. If you go back a hundred years ago, an Angus cow would be maybe up no to more. here. Okay. And then in the 50s and 60s, they went down to this size, really? and they were known as belt buckle cattle. Wow. And that was because of food rations after the war. And then in the 1980s, we had to get them big because all the continental cattle came into the UK. So in the 80s, the cows were this big. So we're just coming back to maybe where we were 100 years ago. So the pendulum always swings, and it comes back to what we always were. That's what domestication is all about. There is a constant competition between generations of both humans and animals, and that's what's so interesting. At the end of the day, there's a real relationship between humans and animals. These might be highly modified superbreeds, but they have gained from their conformity and from being bred slightly less heavy, so they can manage better on their own. That isn't always the case. At this show, I saw some of the world's most manipulated and transformed species. These animals could not survive the wild. I saw animals at the end of the chain, a consequence of domestication pushed to its limits. The Scots are expert breeders, and they have also preserved their early breeds, which still live in the highlands and the surrounding countryside. I'm going on a long journey. I'm going to leave Edinburgh, otherwise known as the Athens of the North. You can see why with its Acropolis and all these monuments. And I'm going to head north to the Shetland Islands via the highlands and Loch Ness, observing all the wildlife and domesticated animals. I'm heading north, going back in time. 7 centuries ago this area of land was under the sea today these are pastures where domesticated animals roam semi-freely between the dunes and the marshes living in symbiosis with their environment it's a far cry from intensive feedlots and is known as extensive farming I've just passed Aberdeen, which is best known for its oil rigs. The flames burn there day and night. We've already reached an interesting landscape. Look at those sheep. They must be Scottish blackface sheep. There are dunes, so the sea is over there, and over here is a lake. Apparently, there is a nature reserve in the lake. A very early breed of horses is reared here, which I'm interested in. I love catching frogs. Look how beautiful they are. These ones are a reddish colour, red and black. This one looks as if it's been painted. It's a golden-eyed Scottish frog. And there is a flock of lapwings. They are wading birds who inhabit grasslands. These migratory birds used to be shot for game. There's even a French saying, until you've tasted lapwing, you haven't had a tasty morsel. And there are sheep in the middle, as if humans had never set foot here. And yet the sheep wouldn't be here if humans hadn't brought them here. These are mountain sheep from the Mediterranean. They still live in rocky mountain areas, but after several thousand years of domestication, they're also found here, in the wetlands. They weren't made to survive in this climate, but they've been adapted and selected so that they can withstand the damp and the salty sea spray. 
It's amazing. Domestication is a cultural and historical human venture. A few kilometers away is a rather special nature reserve. Here in the middle of the marshland lives a handful of conic horses. They are direct descendants of Tarpan wild horses from Eurasia. They are looked after by Richard, who runs the reserve and is passionate about this area of outstanding natural beauty. He and his team are fighting to preserve it. They're mostly common terns. Yep. Uh, there's a few pairs of black-headed gulls there as okay. well. But also really excitingly, there's one pair of little gulls. Oh, great. Only pair ever. Ever? Oh. Ever. To be proven breeding in Scotland. Oh, great. We are quite excited. Yeah. <laughs> These are water scorpions. They are aquatic insects and they are synonymous with a healthy river. They have quite a powerful rostrum which liquefies their prey so they can literally drink it, so it's best to avoid getting stung. It realized I meant it no harm. Look, that's beautiful. Amazing. It's beautiful. They are emerging from the vegetation. I think some are lying down. Yes, they're lying down. I read that horses sleep for about seven hours a day. Why? Because they're always on the lookout, and their main line of defense is flight. The foals are much lighter in color than the adults. Apparently, the wild tarpon horses, which disappeared from Eurasia and the rest of the world, had the same coloring. They inherited it from their extinct wild ancestors. Look at that stripe. It's most pronounced on their backs, but there are also stripes on their legs, and they have a two-tone mane. If we say that these are as similar to the wild horse that was here 10,000 years ago, yeah. then all the domestic breeds, the fell ponies, the highland ponies, the okay. exmoor ponies, all descended from horses that looked very, very similar to these. Okay. Some breeds have disappeared and mm. others are not quite as numerous as they once were, yeah. But horses still got quite a special place to a lot of, wow. a lot of people, yeah. There is no sign of human life here now. The reserve is a magical place, cohabited by numerous species. It radiates a sense of harmony, and the river adds a certain poetry. People talk about convergent evolution. In other words, two animals which are not very closely related, the yak being a different species to the cow, yet there is a morphological similarity due to a parallel process of adaption. Both animals needed a thick coat to protect them from the cold, wind and snow. So there is a physical resemblance, despite the fact that the cow and the yak are two different species. Great hair, that one. That's a proper fringe. So here I am in the heart of the highlands. I'm really excited because I'm going to be crossing Loch Ness to continue my journey to the Shetland Islands in the far north of Scotland. I've always wanted to go out in a boat on Loch Ness and Stuart is going to show me the lake's underwater fauna. Here goes. Hey, Stuart. Yeah? Yeah. Lovely weather. Very Lovely fine. Weather. Jump in, yes. Oh. Can it be, like, dangerous to navigate in Loch Ness? It's quite rough, just mm. like we see at times. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That's I'm not exactly there. reassuring, okay. but okay. Right. Get the boat started up, and then we're good to go. Now we are free. Yes, we're free. <laughs> Loch Ness is 36 kilometers long and Scotland's biggest lake in terms of volume. It owes its fame to its 240 meter depth, which gives rise to plenty of mystery surrounding the fauna that inhabits it. There are seawater as well as freshwater species, both migratory and sedentary, and lots of people keeping an eye on its waters, shores, and any signs of life in it. I've lived here for 22 years. Really? Um, you're a son of the loch. 
something like that, yes. Almost. You, you see lots of strange things on it. You see animals that wouldn't normally be in here. Sometimes you can see a seal, for instance. It's the biggest volume of water in, okay. in, in Britain. It's 26 miles long, and it could be down to 900 feet deep. Wow. Gosh. Hey. A fisherman's toolkit. Wow. A real treasure trove. It's great. It's great. So, so good. So, so good. Yeah. When Ferrex come in to look at one of these lures, for instance, wow. this one, Brutal. You, you, you can actually see the, oh. see the teeth marks on it. Really? From a previous fish. Tooth caught. marks from a ferox trout. It went for the bait, then it was probably killed with a trident. Then you put the biggest one to our... I'm very confident today. <laughs> right, just keep us, going to, keep us going out this direction, okay? Yeah, I've got it. I'm at the helm, so this is starting to get serious. Wow, look at that, 200 meters of line. This is serious. Just a case of sitting and waiting. Do you mind if I keep looking on the surface, if maybe no. I see something bigger? That's fine, no problem okay. at all. And Stuart, have you already seen something on the lake? Many times. What could it be, like a mammal or a plesiosaurus? It's, a possibility. Some... it's a possibility, it's a yeah, plesiosaurus. It's a possibility. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I'm on the lock most days of the week. I'm in a position where I'm going yeah, to yeah. see things. What do you see? It's usually some form of splashing. When you see splashing, you are sure that, as you know very well the fish is, that it's not a trout or a salmon. No, no. Salting. No. no. Jumping. No. no, no. No. Keep it tight. Up. Keep it really yep. tight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's something there. Oh. Yes. Great. Sea trout. Whoa. Right. Okay, yeah. Hold on a second. I'll hold the just, just while I get these out. Oh, the man, you... That's amazing. Just this is a sea bit. trout. This fish has come from the sea to spawn in the river. It has this bluish silver colour which is in the process of turning green so as to pass unnoticed in the dark waters of Loch Ness. I'll take a small scale sample from it yeah, and I'll, I'll send the scale to the department that ages fish. There, now it's time to release it. There it goes. <gasps> Straight. Yep. Very good. Excellent. Thank Not you. <laughs> What will you do with the scales you took? I'll send them away to the local fishery department okay. for analysis. The results will show what the fish has been eating, okay. um, whether the fish has been to sea or not, yeah. and how long it's been living in fresh water. Wow. Let's see what we can observe. Thank you, Stuart. No problem. Take care, all guys. Thanks. Well, Here I am, in the Highlands, north of Loch Ness. I'm going in search of the primitive breeds that live in these parts, and I also want to explore the ecosystems to be found here. Let's go. Beyond Loch Ness, Scotland is better known for its moors than for its ancient Caledonian forest which is hardly surprising since it has virtually disappeared. Excessive deforestation and overgrazing are leading to the demise of a unique ecosystem, which is actually far more Scottish than the moors which have resulted from this huge decline of woodland. It is a disaster for biodiversity, but one man has been fighting to remedy it for over 30 years. The forest is his life. His name is Alan Watson Featherstone, and he paints a grim picture. There was yeah. a forest here Dead, 50 yeah. years ago. Dead branches, more stumps over here. This is a ruined landscape. Mm -hmm. It's a wrecked ecosystem. Wow. And people think it's natural, and people think it's beautiful. The Scottish Tourist Board promotes beautiful treeless Scotland, wide open views. We've got very little forest left, yeah. and we've got far too many grazing animals, particularly red deer. Is it, the, so, is it what we call overgrazing? Exactly, yes. It's incredible. There isn't a single tree here, and yet there are deer droppings everywhere. 
Well, well, they're not that fresh. They're a bit fresher. Okay. When they're fresh, they're black and shiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these have dried up a little bit. But what's happened is we've taken away the predators. Yeah. So we have no wolves, we have no bear, no we have wolves. no lynx. They're all gone from Scotland. And the deer numbers have increased and the forest has shrunk. So the deer have been eating their own habitat yeah. to death for 200 years. Do you recognize that it's a deer, red deer? Well, it's the, si the size of it. It's a stag, it's had antlers, yeah, you as you dancers. can see. Okay. And they, they cast their antlers every year and grow them again. Oh. So this animal has died here. There's a few other bones where we found this skull. Do you think it can be linked to the fact that there is no enough food for them? Almost certainly, yes. The teeth are, you know, they're not that worn down, these teeth. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was old, they'd be really worn down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what are these little uh, insects that are rushing me at the time? <laughs> these are the Highland Biting Midge. Midge, Midge. Okay. <laughs> I believe they're another reflection of our broken ecosystem. Really? Because when you disturb and damage an ecosystem, and many parts of the ecosystem go, mm. Some that are left that are opportunistic are able to multiply and spread. So the ecosystem is totally, if you think an ecosystem. Yeah, I see, because all, with all these insects, I am starting to hate my own species. <laughs> if you tell me that the man is responsible of that, <laughs> and of that, yeah. and of the presence, over presence of the deer. Ah. The more we try to control and manipulate nature, the more it eludes us and turns against us. Unless people start listening to Alan, these ancient forests will be no more than a distant memory. This is the ultimate find for me, having crossed these desolate moorlands that are so characteristic of the highlands. Come face to face with a species that is typical of the far north, the black-throated loon. It's a bird with a slender body, a head like a dragon, and a needle-shaped beak. It is very delicate, black with white checks on its back, and a velvety grey head. Extraordinary. The numbers are dwindling. I think there are only a few dozen pairs nesting here in Scotland. Let's not disturb them any longer. The most important stage of my journey starts here, because I'm heading for the Shetland Islands to find out more about the primitive breeds reared there, and kept alive by a group of farmers who are going to explain domestication to me and introduce me to breeds we think we know, but barely know at all. Species of sheep, cows, horses, which have existed since the dawn of time and evolved into a very particular shape. I am excited to be leaving the Highlands for the Shetland Islands. The Shetland Islands, also known as the Galapagos of the North. The land here is flat. For farmers, that's a godsend. This tiny archipelago is battered by the winds and lies between the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. Here, time seems to have stood still its rhythms dictated by nature. This land is a sanctuary for numerous species. It's a magical and enchanting place. The 
the Shetland Islands, miles out at sea, a home to a host of amazing species that are native to the far north and that come here to nest. This is an Atlantic puffin. I really came here for the puffins because they're extraordinary birds. They are known as sea parrots because of their sumptuous plumage and colourful beaks. They are not necessarily migratory birds, but are seen as erratic since they only come ashore to nest. The rest of the year they are out to sea, so they fall foul of oil slicks and fuel tanks being emptied. These birds really bear the brunt of human excesses. Opposite is Canada, and over there is the Faroe Islands and Greenland. Up there is the North Pole, and over there is Norway. We really are in the middle of nowhere, but apparently some key domestic breeds have survived here, so I've come to find out more about them. This morning, I'm going to meet Ronnie, one of the Shetland Islands' most successful farmers. Like his father and grandfather before him, he rears a rare breed of sheep and has a flock of about 1,500. Together, we're going to prepare them for shearing, a key date in a sheep farmer's calendar. Hey, Ronnie. How are you? Very well, thank you. <sighs> Such a beautiful place, huh? Uh, yeah, this is this your bad. lens around? Yeah, yeah. yeah wow. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the sheep I saw on my side, like when uh, yeah, I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. They are no. Shetland sheep? Yeah, Shetland sheep, yes. Great. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. What's so, the program then? Well, we must go and gather some sheep uh, because uh, the sheep shearers are coming tomorrow to okay. club some sheep. So ah. we would need to go uh, out to that hill. Right now. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry, okay. but uh, time. No, and, no, it's uh, okay, it's okay. <laughs> I imagine that you depend on weather a lot. No? Oh, yeah, yeah. We need to get them in while they're dry. Okay. They must be dry to get the wool off uh, because we want to sell the wool. Is that your son? Yes, this is Jacob. Hello. Nice to meet you. Remy, nice to meet you. I come in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Did you do right, it? I go in the back. Great. You and Dad will go along the skyline. Uh, yeah, I see. Yeah. At the top of the, of the hill. Yeah, top of the hill. Yeah. Great. The, the, why? Because the sheep, they are everywhere on this territory, like uh, yeah. on the land, they can be. Everywhere. Uh, yeah. There is no fence, there is. Oh, there is, but it's quite big. There, there is, but it's a very extensive area. Great. Then it's what we can call extensive breeding. <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> ah, there are dogs here too. And who are you? Can I come here? From here? Okay. Ah, good jump. We head over here. And yeah. We have to go up to the top of that hill there. Okay. Wow, it's big then, huh? <laughs> How many sheep do you have on this one? Uh, here, maybe 150. They are uh, a native breed which has been here in the islands for at least 5,000 years. Really? It's almost at the beginning of the domestication of species. That's right, species. yes, yes. They would have been not too different from what they are now, possibly more uh, colored sheep brown and that color. There are more white sheep now, but that's because the spinners, mm -hmm. the people who buy the wool, yeah. ah, really only want white because then they can dye it any color. Okay, it's why we have mostly white sheep around the world. Yeah, that's or? exactly right, yeah. yes. yes, yes. It's not because the sheep want to be white, then we it's because it. man, man wants yeah. them to be white. <laughs> <laughs> These sheep have uh, quite small feet yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, quite thin bones, so they are much more designed for walking along steep areas with uh, steep slopes. I see because they are much faster than us. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even yeah, if they yeah. are four legs, and <laughs> that's just two. <laughs> One with three legs would be faster than me. Oh, yeah, with the stick. It's... <laughs> <laughs> then, Ronnie, what will we do now? We separate? Oh, or? Yeah, yeah. I, I go this side of this fence up this way. Yeah. And I'll move that ship along that way. If you go up this side of the fence, yeah. then maybe the ship will not come down again. OK, then I block this yes, side. Yes, OK, perfect. Yeah, yeah. OK. Let's right. go. OK, you take the dogs. Yeah. Erleu, <laughs> erleu. Here, 
It's a nightmare. I have never seen anything like it. The sheep give up after a while. That one looks like a wild mountain sheep. The worst is over for Ronnie and me. The flock has been rounded up and is just a few metres from the barn where it will spend the night. Come on! Come on! I see Ronnie giving orders to his dogs from afar, gently nudging the sheep on. Sheep dogs obviously have a predator's instinct, which humans have tried to channel. Come on! Come on! Sheep dogs have been bred to stop short of attacking the sheep. However, faced with misbehaving sheep, rams or hard-headed ewes, the dogs might go so far as to take a bite out of the back of their legs. Sometimes they go further. Accidents happen. We need to be careful here because that's a lamb. It's okay. All ready for shearing. They'll get their chance to calm down now. Tomorrow will be another stressful day. The bleating we can hear is coming from the lambs calling to their mothers because they've lost them in the crush. And the mothers recognize the bleating of their lambs, so they will soon be reunited with them. As soon as I return this one to the fold, he'll start bleating. There. The relationship between humans and sheep dates back over 10,000 years. Tomorrow will be a special day for these men and their flock of sheep. It's quite an event. Shearing these sheep for wool is a skill passed down through thousands of years of sheep farming. On the verdant pastures of the Shetland Islands lives another ancient breed, which has long been world famous. These Shetland ponies are likely descended from early Northern European horses. Hiya. How are you? Good, thanks. Close to your ponies? Yeah. Hi, sir. And it seems to be a very family stuff for you. <laughs> yeah, my mum and my grandfather started the stud in the really? 60s. So we've always had ponies in the, as long as I can remember. But traditionally, obviously, they were used to, to, to carry uh -huh. people back and forth as transport. In the 60s, that was used to, well, for kids' ponies, but it's a brilliant first pony for a child to, to start I learning imagine. with. Yeah, very squat, very robust, very short. Mm -hmm. Is it is it a consequence of living in this kind of ecosystem? Very yeah, yeah difficult, it's harsh environment. In the winter, it's uh, very very windy. Cold wind, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. But so they have adapted to get themselves compact, and their metabolism converts energy very easily. So. Oh, there is very young one. <laughs> There's a little one, yeah. <laughs> so small. How old is he? Yeah, um, probably about five weeks. Beautiful eyes. We're going to pick up two mares and two foals and try and get them into the back of the truck. To give the pasture a chance to grow back, the horses must change fields. The difficulty is, some need to be picked up. And we can't put the foals on a leash, so we just have to hope that they follow their mothers. Go on, follow your mother. It's a nightmare. They look like wild horses eh? when we yeah. see them running like that. They're digging their heels in. It's very common. Primitive breeds are often very stubborn. They're closer to wild animals and they do a lot of things instinctively. If they don't want to get in, you can't make them. What are you going to do? Use a dart gun or set a trap? No, it's up to the foals and the horses to decide. Come on, you youngsters. Yeah. 
Allez. Allez, les jeunes. This one is quite tame for us. Yeah, he's, he's, how young he is. He's calm, huh? He's calm because with mother? Yeah. And then will you try to put the, the harness on the little one? Yeah. That's the first time, yeah. It's the first time? <laughs> okay, it's gonna be okay. We try to reward them so we, we hold the rope and we put a little bit of pressure. Uh -huh. If they take a one step forward, then you relax the rope and reward. Come on, it will all be over soon. If they start chewing and licking their lips, that normally means they're submissive to what what's going on. We'll go out into a little bit more space. It's the same technique as with dogs, taking the first steps on the lead, teaching the animal to wear a collar and to be restrained by an extension of its master's hand. The training sessions must not last any longer than 20 minutes or the animal will grow tired and disgruntled. She's doing very well. Yeah? He's in peace huh, with, the, with the lead. Yeah, he seems quite happy just now. Uh, do you have a special feeling when you are like that close to the horse? Do you do you feel the, the history of the breed that is very specific and unique? Yeah, it's, uh, you certainly have an affinity with them. I'm trying to maintain or improve the breed standard. There's a danger if you don't keep uh, looking towards the standards that you can breed from things that uh, wouldn't normally survive because you're in a nice, cozy environment. Off you go, like you say, calm and placid. They aren't great gallopers. Good girl. She did well. She did well. As shown by Irvin and his protege, domestication creates a special bond between humans and animals. The survival of most animals bred using a process of artificial selection, although the primitive breeds in the Shetland Islands would happily dispense with humans. Here, humans have somehow managed to preserve the wild nature of these species. Their adaptability and robustness is their dignity. These animals respond to the call of the wild as soon as the gate to a paddock or an enclosure is opened. They still have an innate survival instinct. The time has come. It's Ronnie's big day. Shearing his flock is a special event, a day of celebration when people come together to carry out these age-old traditions. Every year, this special day begins with a communal breakfast. Is it kind of a tradition, almost a ritual, like the shearing day? <laughs> yeah. Boys, you can explain what it used to be like. I mean, it was a, a very much a collective affair before. Mm -hmm. The neighbours usually come to help. Now there are so few people working on the land. Uh, most people are uh, finding jobs elsewhere because the, there's not the income. It's not easy to maintain the spirit and the confidence among the young people because it's not easy for them to invest in their own future if they think there's nothing going to be done. Yeah. Uh, we are some of the last uh, optimists. I see. <laughs> this is Shetland wool? Yeah. All of that? Then this one must come from black sheep or yeah. dark dark yeah, brown. This doesn't come from red sheep. Okay. okay. <laughs> they make organic wool here, so naturally it smells. It still smells of the sheep in the fields. It's just my way of trying to make a business that will hopefully survive. There's a market interest in it. Mm -hmm. I've read that the the sheep were domesticated first uh, for the meat. In some ways, I see the wool as much more valuable than the lamb. The world is full of Shetland wool, but very little of it actually seems to come from Shetland. It's homemade. Wow! These are ancient scissors, shearing scissors. You need to have them very sharp, just so they make them look nicer for a, for a show. It's like the hairdresser is uh, the good hairdressers, they still use uh, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> He's paid money to get like yeah. <laughs>
The fight is on. The sheep must be shorn, and they are corralled through a series of corridors. Here, we have a sort of access ramp with a barrier to keep the sheep in single file so they can enter in one by one in a relatively orderly fashion. Every now and again, a shearer will come and lower this, grab a sheep, pull it out, sit on its bottom, and start shearing. Once a year, the sheep need to be relieved of their thick coats. If they are not shorn, they struggle to shed them of their own accord, and they can rot. Two shearers for 300 sheep. This is going to take the best part of the day. It's actually quite light. Some of the wool is dirty because it was close to close to the anus, so naturally the sheep has, anyway, the undesirable parts are removed. How do you separate the different kind of wool? Like, I, I understood at first you do like a selection by the color, but then what happens? This is, this is very fine. Very fine? This is very fine. That's, that's bunch here. Ah, in quality after you, you select very quality. Oh yeah, it's yeah. like a Spider's web. spider web. What they say about Shetland wool is that it, it has a, a good handle. Wow. This one is ready for the, the scarf to be made. <laughs> the wool soon deteriorates if it's not spun. Once it has been spun, you can do whatever you like with it. It makes durable clothing, which is flexible and keeps you warm when it's damp. Phew. Very old one. Ah, ouais, no it's unbelievable. This ewe, who had me chasing all over the mountainside after her, is actually a grandmother. She's really old, and apparently she shed her coat naturally, so they didn't even need to shear her. Why don't we shear the, the young ones? It would be cruel to shear them because they, that's their only wool for this next winter. Okay. This one is waiting for his mum to finish at the hairdressers. I want to try it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep the skin tight. Very tight. If the skin goes like that, okay. then you cut it. I, I take one behind my leg. Okay. Uh, where? Of course, I'm afraid to hurt him. Aye. <laughs> okay, like that? Wow, it's not easy. You're cutting along an artery here. Well, I think I will let you finish, no? Can't push it. think that, as Darwin said, the species which survive are the most adaptive ones? I don't think people realize just how uh, clever the animals actually are. They have uh, an ability that uh, science couldn't put in a syringe and inject into an animal. It's something that uh, takes thousands of years yeah, to yeah. develop. The breeds that have been developed throughout the 20th century have been developed to suit a market, and productivity, not, yeah, and not to suit, suit uh, and not to suit a place. Do you think we could climb? Uh, which way? In order to have the view. <laughs> well, it's up to you. It's all steep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Wow! Oh, it's great. You see the, the sea from both sides. Yes. We feel great. here in the middle of... North Sea? Yeah. Atlantic. Atlantic. When you look at these islands out here, yeah. all these uh, outer islands, all were inhabited. No, they're all empty. Populations, they've lost their understanding of their heritage. The species has been here long, long before man yeah. ever was here. And uh, you start to get the position where you're taking judgments over whether man should rule the world or whether man is part of the world. And let's see how next generation behave. Yeah, well, I have uh, grandchildren now, and I would like them to be able to come here and um, to see what people have done before and actually to take pride in it. They have not taken time to actually understand the blood and sweat that went into making life possible in these places. What we do now is done on the basis of the future. Thank you, Ronnie, for welcoming me <laughs> okay, well, in your place. I hope you never forget us. No, I will not. <laughs>